Welcome to Lecture 48, in which I will be raising and addressing the question, is everything relative? Your impression of relativity right now probably is that it messes up our notions of space and time, that measures of space and time depend on reference frames. It kind of plays around with your mind and plays around with your common sense ideas of space and time, and it makes everything relative. And that's a very common philosophical view, and I would say misunderstanding of relativity theory. It's such an important misunderstanding that soon after relativity came out in the early 1900s, uh, people were using relativity theory, Einstein's relativity, to justify relativistic morals, relativistic aesthetics, all kinds of fields far from science were saying, well, if everything is relative, it's all relative in our field too. If you think about what physics is really about, physics is about trying to understand an objective physical reality, an underlying physical reality. I don't know that we ever get a perfect understanding of it, but we try to get closer and closer to it. And many of us in physics, at least, and some philosophers too, agree that physics is about an underlying objective reality that we're trying to understand. And I would claim that that reality should not depend on one's point of view. Things that are dependent on your particular viewpoint for which you can read frame of reference, state of motion, aren't in some sense objective reality. Because if I view something this way and you view it another way by virtue of being in a different reference frame, that thing that we're both viewing but viewing differently doesn't really have an objective reality. Physics ought to be about those underlying things that have objective reality that don't depend on one's point of view, don't depend on one's frame of reference, don't depend on one's state of motion. This lecture is about identifying such quantities and developing from them a really important idea of four dimensions and four-dimensional space-time. We already know of one quantity or one thing that doesn't depend on your point of view, and that, well, one quantity is the speed of light. But that's not the fundamental thing. The fundamental thing, of course, is the laws of physics. The laws of physics do not depend on your point of view. The laws of physics are some underlying objective reality that don't depend on your point of view. The numbers one gets out of those laws of physics, at least for some things, like spatial distances or temporal intervals, do depend on your point of view. Other numbers don't, such as, for example, the speed of light. So to get at some of those quantities that don't depend on your point of view, let's begin by taking another look at our star trip. So here's our star trip, and now I want to focus on the time and place involved in the star trip. So remember we had event A, or we are now going to call that event A, the spaceship is passing the Earth. And by the way, I'm going to use the word passes here so I don't have to deal with the spaceship accelerating or changing motion. I'm just going to consider this spaceship comes whizzing past Earth at point eight C, never changing its motion. And right at the time the Earth and ship coincide, the clocks both read zero. Event B is going to be the ship passing the star. We know from our previous lecture's calculations that at that point the ship clock reads 7.5 years and the Earth and star clocks each read 12.5 years. And I'm going to ask the question, what is the time interval in these two reference frames between these two events? And we've already calculated that. It's 12.5 years in the Earth star frame. It's uh, a distance of 10 light years in the Earth star frame. What about the distance between those two events in the ship frame and the time interval between them? Well, the time interval we know, it's 7.5 years. We're seeing it right here on the clock. What about the distance between those two events? in the ship's frame. That one's a little bit more subtle. Your first answer might be, well, it's uh, six light years because we calculated that as the distance between the Earth and the star in the ship's frame. That is indeed the distance between the Earth and star, but it isn't the distance in the ship's frame between the event of the ship passing Earth and the event of the ship passing the star. Because in the ship's point of view, the pilot is sitting there in the ship, and first she sees the Earth come by, and 7.5 years later she sees the star come by, and she hasn't moved. In her reference frame, she is sitting in the pilot seat still. Now you might say, but she's really moved in the Earth and star heaven. Nuh-uh. You're being relativistically incorrect if you try to say that. Relativity does not allow you to distinguish between those two different frames in uniform motion. And that's why, by the way, I wanted to make sure the ship was just continuing on in unaccelerated, unchanging uniform motion in this case. Its frame of reference is just as good 
as the Earth star frame of reference. And in that frame of reference, the Earth coincides with the pilot seat on the ship. And 7.5 years later, the star coincides with the pilot seat on the ship. And consequently, the distance between those two events, as measured in the ship frame, the distance the pilot of the ship has to move in her frame to get from one event to the other, is zero. Her frame of reference is present at both events. And consequently, in the ship frame, delta T, and I'm going to call it AB, between the two events is 7.5 years, delta T prime, and delta X prime is zero light years. No distance in the ship's frame. doesn't say the Earth and star are in the same place, but because the Earth and star are moving past the ship, the distance between the event of the Earth coinciding with the ship and the event of the star coinciding with the ship is, in fact, zero light years. Okay, let's go to our big screen and do a little bit of mathematics with that. So here are the results we just had. In the Earth star frame, the time interval between events A and B, and I'm dropping the subscript AB here, we understand what events we're talking about, is 12.5 years. Delta X, the distance measured in that frame between the two events, not between two objects, but between two events, although in this case they're the same, is 10 light years. In the ship's frame, delta T prime is only 7.5 years by time dilation. We understand why that's occurring. And delta X prime, as I just argued, is zero light years, not six light years, zero light years because somebody sitting in the spaceship does not have to move relative to the spaceship to be present when the ship passes Earth and when the ship passes the star or in their frame when the Earth passes the ship and then when the star passes the ship. Now I'd like to ask the question, what is this quantity delta T squared minus delta X squared? And I'm going to work in these units of light years and years. And in those units, the speed of light is one, one light year per year. So the math is going to come out easily. In the Earth star frame S, it's delta T squared minus delta X squared. That's 12.5 years minus uh, squared minus the 10 light years squared. That's 12.5 squared minus 10 squared. And because the speed of light is one in light years per year, we don't need to do any kinds of conversions. What's 12 and a half squared? Well, you could work that out pretty quickly or do it with your calculator. 12 squared is 144, so it's a little more than that. It's in fact 156.25. Five times five is 20. You can see where that's going to come from. Do a little arithmetic. 10 squared is 100. So 156.25 minus 100 is 56.25. That's this quantity delta T squared minus delta X squared. What is it in the ship frame? In the ship frame, it's delta T prime squared minus delta X prime squared. That's the 7.5 years squared minus the zero light years. What's 7.5 squared? Well, 7 squared is 49. It's going to be a little bit more. Work it out. It's 56.25 minus zero, 56.25. That quantity is the same in both reference frames. That quantity is something that is objectively real. That quantity is something that does not depend on your reference frame. That quantity is a quantity related to both space and time, which is why the title of this view here is space-time. We've discovered something that is invariant, something that doesn't depend on your point of view, something that doesn't change with your frame of reference. And that something is basically delta t squared minus delta x squared, the difference between the square of the time interval between two events and the spatial interval, the distance between the two events. That's something that has that objective reality that I said physics ought to be about. The individual measures of space and time don't. They're different in the two different frames of reference. But from them, you can combine and get something that is objectively real. And I'd like to spend a little time talking about that objectively real thing that we can form, the invariant space-time interval, I'm going to call it. So here was our calculation of it. I'll now take this off the screen so it won't distract us. But remember, we calculated delta t squared minus delta x squared. And we got the same result in two different reference frames. It's invariant. It's unchanging. OK, so let's take a look here at an anatomy of this equation, the equation for the invariant space-time interval. It's delta s squared, I'm going to call it, is delta t squared minus delta x squared the difference between the temporal and spatial intervals. And that's equal in the prime frame of reference or the unprimed frame of reference or any other frame of reference in uniform motion. You measure those two quantities between two events, the spatial and temporal intervals. You take their difference, and you get a number which doesn't depend on your point of view, on your frame of reference. So delta s is the space-time interval between two events. Delta t and delta x are the temporal and spatial intervals, separations between those events in some frame. 
capital S, which is the unprime frame, and delta T prime and delta X prime are the same quantities measured in a different frame of reference. That space-time interval is invariant. If we went away from measuring, uh, measure, measuring distances in light years and time in years, but did this in SI units, the standard meters and seconds, we would have to have the speed of light in there, and we would find that the expression is delta S squared is C squared delta T squared, the C coming in to be kind of a conversion between time and space. And then in all three dimensions, we can have we do have a Pythagorean theorem kind of addition, delta X squared plus delta Y squared plus delta Z squared. But the structure of this thing is the same. It's some invariant quantity squared is the temporal separation squared minus the spatial separation squared. That's what we call the invariant space-time interval. Now, it might bother you that events simultaneous in one frame aren't simultaneous in another. It might bother you about causality. It might bother that we have different time intervals between different events. Is that a problem for causality? It turns out not to be. If we look at the space-time interval carefully and look at its sign, and notice, by the way, it's the square of the space-time interval talk we're talking about here, not the interval itself. So there's the space-time interval between two events. There's the time separation. There's the spatial separation. Multiply the time separation by C, and you get the distance light would travel in the time between the events. So C squared T squared is the square of C times T, and that's the distance light would travel in the time T between the two events, or the time delta T. So that's causality and the space-time interval. What does this have to do with causality? Well, here's a little table. In the left-hand column, I've got the sign of this delta S squared. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it zero? What if it's positive? If it's positive, that means the first term is bigger, and that means the separation in space is in some sense, in time rather, is in some sense bigger than the separation in space when you multiply by the C to account for the different measures we use for time and space or when you measure it in light years and years. Could these events be causally related? Yes, if they're farther apart in time than they are in space. They could be causally related because an observer could travel from one event to another in less time than it takes light to get there. The events could influence each other. And there is no frame of reference in that case in which those events would be judged simultaneous. I'm not proving that mathematically, but I'm going to tell you that. They're, they are not simultaneous in any frame. However, there will be a frame in which they're at the same place. And that would be like the event of the spaceship passing Earth and the spaceship passing the star, and the events of those two events are, are in the same place in the spaceship frame of reference. In no frame of reference are they simultaneous. On the other hand, if this delta S squared comes out negative, then the second term, the, the term that's being subtracted, is bigger, and they are farther apart in space than they are in time, or to be a little more precise, they're farther apart in space than the distance light could travel in the time between the events. There is no way even a light signal could get between the events because nothing can travel faster than light. There's no way one event can influence the other. They cannot be causally related. And there will be some reference frame in which they're simultaneous. There will be no reference frame in which they're at the same place, but there will be one in which they're simultaneous, and in other reference frames, one event will occur before the other, A will occur before B, and in another reference frame, A will occur after B, and it doesn't matter, because these events cannot be causally related, because they're too far apart in space. That's called a space-like interval as opposed to a time-like interval. And there's a dividing line, which is delta S squared being zero. That's called a light-like interval. They can just barely be causally related. The only thing that could do the causality in that case is a light ray itself, something moving at the speed of light. So there is space-time intervals and causality, and I want to wrap up this section on space-time interval with an analogy in two dimensions, an analogy with vectors. So here are two points A and B in two-dimensional space in a plane. We describe the relationship between those two points by a vector, delta vector r, which describes their separation. And in this picture and in my discussion so far, I haven't said anything about coordinate systems, components of that vector, anything like that. That vector, that physical separation between points A and B in two-dimensional space is objectively real, regardless of how I describe it mathematically. How would I describe it mathematically? Well, I could slap a coordinate system, a human mathematical artifact, on that physical reality. And I might say, for example, establishing this xy coordinate system, that this is a vector described by an x component delta x of 1, 2, 3, 4 units, and a y component delta y of 1, 2, 3 units up the y axis. 
But there is nothing magic or special or objectively real about the coordinate system, even though there is about the vector delta r. I could put on a different coordinate system that happened to be twisted like that. And in that coordinate system, there is an x separation of approximately one, two, three, four, and something units, almost five units, delta x prime, and a smaller delta y prime. Those are both equally valid ways to describe that vector delta r. And if I wanted to do a calculation, I would use the Pythagorean theorem and ask the question, how long is that vector r? And I would find that the diagonals of those two triangles, the hypotenuses of those two right triangles, obviously they're the same. They're the same thing. Delta x squared plus delta y squared would equal delta x prime squared plus delta y prime squared. And I would say, look, the interval, the length, the distance between these two points is invariant. It's in that sense that the interval in space-time between two events in space-time is an invariant quantity. It's in four dimensions rather than two in this analogy. And furthermore, it is uh, a Pythagorean theorem that's modified slightly because it involves that subtraction. And that makes all the difference between Euclidean geometry and the geometry of even special relativity, which isn't Euclidean because of the subtraction between the the spatial and the temporal parts. The space-time interval is just one example of something which is analogous to that vector I just drew in two dimensions, and that's called a four-vector. These are vector quantities in four-dimensional space-time. They have four components. They have one time component, as did our space-time interval. They have three space components. Their magnitude is invariant, and their magnitude is given by the square magnitude is the square of the time component minus the square of the space component. I'm not going to go into detailed mathematics of these, but I want to give you just a feel for this four-dimensional reality. The paradigm forward vector is the one we worked out and calculated its invariant interval, its variant, invariant magnitude on the big screen. Its time component is C delta T. Its three space components are delta X, delta Y, and delta Z. But there are plenty of other four vectors. And one of the most important ones is one that's the term momenergy has been coined for this four vector. Not everyone uses it, but I think it's a wonderful term. The momenergy four vector is a vector that combines energy and momentum into one four-dimensional mathematical object, a vector. Its time component is an object's total energy, E. Its three space components are three components of the momentum. Remember momentum from Newtonian physics. P is mass times velocity. It's slightly modified in relativity. It's mass times velocity divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, that quantity we've seen several times. That's the momenergy four vector. And its invariant magnitude turns out to be the object's mass, or I should say, is proportional to the object's mass. And here is the formation of that invariant magnitude. It's mc squared, something proportional to the object's mass. c is just a constant. Square that. You get the square of the magnitude of this invariant four vector. You take the time component E, you square it, you subtract the momentum, again, multiplied by C to get the units to come out, right? C squared, um, and P squared, C squared. And there is the invariant magnitude proportional to the object's mass. That's a statement. That's often called the relativistic energy-momentum relationship. But really what it is, is a statement about the magnitude of one of these invariant quantities. And it shows you something important in relativity. Mass is an invariant. The mass of an object is invariant. It's a property fundamentally of an object and does not depend on your frame of reference. Its energy does, its momentum does, but they depend in such a way that they conspire to give the same invariant magnitude to the momenergy vector, the momenergy four vector, and that invariant magnitude is essentially within constants, the object's mass. P, again, is uh, the sum of the squares of the three space components of the momentum. And let's look at what happens in an object's rest frame. If I'm at rest with respect to an object, P is zero. It's got no momentum in its rest frame. And what does this equation say? It says E, the only term that's left on the right-hand side, is equal to mc squared. And I've been able to take the square root in that case of both sides. And I get E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation. This is not, by the way, how Einstein derived it in that simple addendum to his relativity paper that he published a few months later. But this is a really good way to look at it. When you're in the rest frame of an object, the relationship between energy, momentum, and mass reduces to E equals mc squared. And that tells you that an object has a ma- has an energy equal to mass times the square of the speed of light, even when the object is at rest. There's a rest energy that Einstein basically discovered through deriving this formula that says there is energy contained in an object even when it's at rest.
Now, E equals mc squared is one of the most famous equations in all of physics. It's one I need to spend a little bit of time on, but not too much time, because I think its importance is exaggerated. So let me talk a little bit about that. It was first proposed in Einstein's, that footnote paper I've mentioned. Does the inertia of a body, inertia being a word that sort of means the same as mass, but not quite, it means it's resistance to changes in motion, does the inertia depend on energy content? It's a special case of the energy-momentum relation, that is the magnitude of the momenergy four vector, that you get when you're in a particle's rest frame, so the particle has no momentum. It expresses a kind of interchangeability between matter and energy. And here's the important thing. It applies to all energy and matter. It is commonly but wrongly associated only with nuclear energy. And I want to emphasize that point. And let me go over here and just look at a couple of examples. Here is a bowling ball sitting on the table. If I lift the bowling ball, ah, I've done some work and I've put some energy into the system. And the system consisting of bowling ball and earth, by virtue of that extra potential energy that the bowling ball now has, it's actually the whole system of bowling ball and earth and the gravitational interaction between them that has extra energy and therefore extra mass. I take this rubber band and I go ah, and stretch it. It's now got stored elastic potential energy. If I let go, it'll snap back. That stored energy gives it more mass, more inertia. It would be harder to accelerate the stretched rubber band, and it would weigh more than if the rubber band were unstretched. Those are examples of E equals mc squared, and you'll notice they have nothing at all to do with nuclear physics. Let's look at some other examples. The sun is converting about 4 million tons of its mass to energy each second, spewing out energy at the rate of about 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. Particle annihilation, matter and antimatter, a matter particle and its antimatter counterpart, when they come together, they annihilate to form pure energy. If you think this is some esoteric thing, if you've had a PET scan in a hospital, PET stands for positron emission tomography. We're looking at positrons um, and the gamma rays coming out when the positrons annihilate with electrons, and that's how we pinpoint things that are going on in your body. Pair creation, the opposite process occurs in our particle accelerators and in certain events in the universe where particle-antiparticle pairs are created out of pure energy. And the picture you see here is a stylized drawing of what you'd see in a particle accelerator. You see two particles. They have opposite electric charges. They're spiraling opposite, in opposite directions in a magnetic field. And those spiral tracks tell us that they're identical particles except for their electric charge. They're a pair of particles and antiparticle. And the fact that they came into existence out of nothing, but not really out of nothing, out of pure energy. Uh, nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is one example of a process that converts matter into energy. It converts a relatively small fraction, less than a tenth of a percent of the uranium mass gets converted to energy in nuclear fission. It's not a very efficient process, not like annihilating matter and antimatter would be, but it's much more efficient than chemical processes. They convert a very tiny fraction of their fuel mass to energy. There is nothing nuclear about E equals mc squared. It's just the discrepancy in mass that you make by releasing energy is measurable in the nuclear case, and it's so immeasurably small in the chemical case. That's why, for example, fueling that coal-burning power plant shown in the picture at the lower right takes anywhere from oh, 10 to, to 14, 110 car trainloads of coal every week, whereas fueling that nuclear power plant, which puts out the same amount of electricity, is accomplished every year to 18 months with one or two truckloads of uranium fuel. That's the difference. One is converting more of its mass to energy, but they're both converting mass to energy, and they're both converting the same amount of mass to energy if they put out the same amount of electrical energy. Okay, let's do a quick quantitative example that illustrates this idea of interchangeability of mass and energy. So let's go to our big screen. I'm going to title this one Antimatter in the Hospital and in the Galaxy, and I'm going to ask the question, what's the energy associated with an electron and positron, an electron and an anti-electron coming together and annihilating? The mass of an electron and of a positron, they have identical mass, they just have opposite electric charge, happens to be 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And of course, we know the speed of light. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to a very good approximation. The total mass of these two particles is twice the mass of either one because they have the same mass. And so E equals 2mc squared in this case, where m is the mass of one of those particles. Let's work that out. That's 2 times m times the square of the speed of light. That comes out 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. 
Um, physicists working with high energy particles much prefer to work in a unit called the electron volt, which involves the energy an electron would gain falling through a potential difference of one volt. We don't need the details. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, it happens. And in high energy physicist units, that's 1,022 kilo electron volts, or KeV. And interestingly, that comes out as two gamma rays, two very high energy bursts of electromagnetic wave energy. They're coming in opposite directions if those two particles were at rest. They have to do that to conserve momentum, because if the particles were at rest, the momentum was zero and it's got to stay zero. So they come out in opposite directions. And detecting those two 511 kilovolt gamma rays allows you to pinpoint where the annihilation occurred. In the hospital, that's how we make PET scan images. We're looking at gamma rays that are coming out in opposite directions, and we're looking at particular gamma rays with this particular energy because we know they came from electron-positron annihilation. Where do we get the positrons? We get them from the decay of very short-lived radioisotopes that we typically produce right in the hospital. We do the same thing with astrophysics, positron astrophysics. Here's a spectrum, if you will, energy running along here from 480 to 530 kilo electron volts. Here's the intensity of that gamma ray energy. And this is looking with gamma ray telescopes at the center of the galaxy. And we see a bright, strong peak at 511 kilo electron volts. And that tells us that right there in the center of the galaxy, there's a lot of electron positron annihilation going on. It has to do with the very high energy processes that are occurring in the center of the galaxy. Well, let's move on. Uh, let's look ahead here just a little bit with this whole momentum energy idea. Here it is again, mc squared squared is the energy squared minus the momentum squared scaled by the speed of light. What if light consisted of massless particles? Then m would be zero, and we would have e squared minus p squared c squared equals zero. I can put the p squared c squared to the other side. I can take the square root of both sides, and I get simply e equals pc or p equals e over c for the relationship between energy and momentum of a light particle if light did consist of massless particles. I didn't say it does, although we'll soon see that it does. Uh, there we are, p equals e over c. Let's compare that with a result from lecture 40 for the radiation pressure from electromagnetic waves. There we found there was a pressure that was basically the intensity of the waves divided by the speed of light. The units of that intensity are energy per time per unit area, watts per square meter. The units of pressure are force per area. So that's momentum per time, because force is momentum per time by Newton's second law per area. Let's multiply by area times time. And I get momentum is energy divided by the speed of light c. And that is exactly what this statement of the momentum energy uh, vector, if the particle were massless is saying. We'll see much more about that as we move into quantum physics because we will find out that, in fact, this is looking ahead to light, in fact, being particles with a particular mass, namely zero. Other four vectors, just to mention a few others as we end. There's something called the four current. It's an electric current four vector, except instead of just having electric charge flowing, it's also got a time component, which is the electric charge density. You put those two together, you get a four vector where it comes out current in some frames of reference. If you're moving right along with the charges, you don't see any current, but you do see a charge density. And those two change in a way that give this an invariant magnitude. The space component is the current density. There's something called the four potential, whose time component is the electric potential V that we dealt with. Its space component is something we didn't deal with. It's a potential in magnetism that is itself a three-dimensional vector. There's a wave four vector whose time component is the frequency of a wave, of a wave whose space component is the so-called wave number, that K thing we used in describing waves, except it becomes a vector that also gives the direction of the waves, and you put it together and it has an invariant magnitude for the electromagnetic wave in vacuum, and that magnitude is zero. And that leads directly and very elegantly to a simple derivation of the Doppler effect for electromagnetic waves. Well, let's wrap up with a few of these ideas. Everything is not relative. That's the big takeaway message from this lecture. Reality exists, and there are real quantities in four-dimensional space-time. They have objective reality independent of reference frame. They are called four vectors. They have invariant magnitude. Their space and time components differ in different reference frames. And one of them, the most important one, perhaps, is the space-time interval, delta S squared, C squared, delta T squared, minus the positional difference, delta R. Uh, there's momentergy with this famous relationship, which re results in Einstein's E equals mc squared when you're in the rest frame of a particle. And there are other four vectors I mentioned.
Well, there we are, wrapped up, but let me give you a quick challenge at the end if you would like to do some mathematics. So here's the challenge. The challenge says the nuclear fusion that powers the sun basically combines four protons, each with this mass given quite precisely, with two electrons, each with that mass we gave before in the electron-positron example, and it creates a helium nucleus whose mass is 6.6465 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. How much energy gets released? Let's do this by adding up, first of all, the four protons that we start with, and add to that the two electrons, so we've got four times the mass of the proton, plus two times the mass of the electron. Then we're going to subtract the mass we end up with in the helium, and the answer there is 4.57 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. Let's convert that to energy with E equals mc squared. So that's the 4.57 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms, times 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, 4.11 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. And if you work that out in the physicist units of electron volts, that's about 25 million electron volts. That's a lot of energy coming out of each reaction, reaction in the sun. And that's the energy that makes the sunlight that powers us and all life here on Earth.